As you know, the story of modern IHL really got started with the adoption of this Geneva Convention in 1864. You can see the original copy of this treaty just behind me. That convention was the starting point for the adoption of numerous further IHL treaties. What are the common features of the IHL treaties which form the core of IHL? One of those features is that many of them contain numerous rules and that those rules are very detailed. Let's take the example of the issue of detention in international armed conflicts. The third Geneva Convention contains detailed rules on how to treat prisoners of war. For example, they provide that canteens shall be established in all camps and should sell foodstuffs and ordinary daily articles such as soup and tobacco. The convention also indicates the exact amount of salary that prisoners of war must receive for their work. The health of prisoners of war is also regulated by the third Geneva Convention. Prisoners of war must be medically checked once a month, in particular to detect contagious diseases, such as tuberculosis, malaria and venereal disease. Such a level of detail is very rare in general treaties. However, it is extremely variable in IHL. It must be remembered that the rules will be applied by soldiers, and so it is helpful for them to know exactly what they do in concrete scenarios. The main IHL treaties are also characterized by the fact that the number of states which ratify them is particularly high. The four Geneva Conventions have been ratified by almost all states and around 170 states are parties to the two additional protocols. The 1907 The Hague Convention was ratified by almost all the existing states at the time. No, as we will see in the next section, all of its rules are considered as part of customary law and therefore applying to all states. Another major specific feature of the IHL treaties, from which several legal particularities are claimed to derive, is that the basis of obligation is not recipro reciprocity. Before analyzing this in detail, I invite you to read an illustrative decision on that respect, rendered in 2000 by the International Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia, which is normally referred to as the ICTY.